Good evening. Hey boys. Well, it's good to see y'all. I don't get to see you much this summer on Wednesdays. I'm thankful to be here. Just some announcements. Um, of course, our sympathy is extended to Michelle, passing of her grandmother, uh, Renee Ellington. The service will be July the 9th at the Avondale Congregation. Visitation is at 10, Memorial is at 11. And uh, in lieu of flowers, a donation can be made to Georgia Agape and that good work. Keep Mel Bedell in your prayers. Went to see her um, Monday, and she's got some upcoming tests, and she's got a little some fluid on her legs, and so keep her in your prayers and for Travis as he stands by her and, and Mark. Uh, don't forget to silence your cell phones. I know that because mine just buzzed. Um, it's like, where y'all think I am at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, you know? Anyway, Michael Stock, he's going to have a heart ablation June the 28th, so keep him in your prayers. Bonnie Binkley, uh, her sister-in-law, Jackie, keep her in your prayers. She has an upcoming surgery. Gerard is home tonight. He's got some kidney stones. Um, bless his heart. Um, that is not, not good for him. Um, and for Paul, Miss Beth Mitchell's brother, um, Back and forth out of the hospital, they told him that he just needed to go on dialysis or he would have not very long to live. So he needed to take care of some things, and he's undecided on what it is that he would like to do. So pray for, pray for them all, and, uh, and for him especially. Jerry Hall is going to be moving. Uh, most of us know that. And, um, but he's going to be moving, and he's going to need help loading the truck uh, Saturday morning at 9. Not a whole lot of stuff. So, uh, Flossie, we'll see you out there to move, okay? Um, at least cheering us on, okay? Uh, at 9 a.m., and uh, he's going to be moving to North Carolina uh, with Kirk and Pam. Also, Kirk. Kirk got put back in the hospital today. They uh, talked to Dean, his son-in-law, just a little bit ago. Said he can't get his heart rate and his blood pressure down, and so he's being admitted, and... Um, they don't know if it's infection or if it's heart attack. They're not sure what it is. So just uh, keep them in your prayers. See the scroll uh, for VBS needs and information. Uh, we're inviting the entire community. So we're going to need the entire church for help. Um, we're going to pray for rain and walk around with umbrellas. That's what we're going to do. And that will be July the 10th through the 13th. Horizons Camp. Our girls are participating in a service project called Blessing Bags. Uh, see the scroll for the needs for that. On the back table, uh, speaking of VBS, there are VBS little cards, the passport squares or invitations. You can hand deliver those or they are um, pre-labeled to where you can just put a stamp on it and send it in the mail. Uh, grab what you're going to give out. Don't just grab a bundle, but have people in mind. Pray for these invitations. You never know. Uh, you never know. Um, but you can grab those in the back. Also, there's a little sticker in the back with the P Piedmont Road logo, and it has a QR code on it. It's a sticker. Um, take it, put that thing everywhere. Vandalize the whole city with those stickers, and it has a QR code, and for the young, hip crowd, they know what to do with those. And so they'll scan that, and that will take them directly to our website and um, some information that they need. The invitation song is 572. We got our books out tonight, 572, and at the proper time, I will introduce our speaker. Uh, fellas, y'all go right ahead.
not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother and that your days may be long. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witnesses, false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Oh, may you bless us with. We thank you for this food. And please help for everyone that's in the hospital. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's speaker is Matt Wallen. Matt serves, are you a deacon? A deacon at the Oak Hill Congregation over in Rome. Uh, been there for several years, works for House to House, Heart to Heart. Um, Matt is a missionary in a whole lot of ways. He's the best of friend to me, a good man, love his wife Ashley, their three girls, Lainey, Harper, and Maggie. They went to camp with us last week. Stone may or may not be in love with one of them. Uh, and she may or not be in love with him, who knows. But I'm accepting the dowry now and uh, go ahead and arrange that. I think that's easier, don't you? Your parents can pick, anyway. But he's gonna speak to us tonight on the abundant life and sharing Jesus. Matt gets to share Jesus for a living uh, for his job with House to House and um, Matt is a go-getter. He is an encourager, and this, this topic was perfect for him, and I'm um, thankful for him and, and his work. So, Matt, come speak to us. You guys familiar with that? User error? I get a lot of that. What's the deal with that? Uh, Jake mentioned me being a good friend to him. Well, Jake's an easy guy to love, as you know. He's a great guy. And I really kind of hate when people rush children into relationships, even teenagers. It's like, let them be kids. You know, the world will make them grow up quick enough and put all that on them. However, if I can guarantee I'm marrying into this family right here, I'm in. Let's sign them up. Just, you know, somebody will marry Stone for sure. We'll figure out who later, if that's all right. Uh, I, I had a joke for Jake. I, I thought it might be too mean to share, but I was going to look around and see um, Paul is here. And typically when you speak somewhere, you don't get to see your preacher friends because they're all speaking somewhere else too. And so I know Paul's here somewhere. I thought Chuck might be here. Kevin's a great preacher. And I was going to say, you know, it, it's intimidating being at best the fourth best preacher in the room. And I was going to say to Jake, like, I don't know how you do it every Sunday, being the fourth best preacher in the room. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure, but... I thought it was too mean, but I told him, and he said, no, they'll love it. So I uh, figured I would share that, that with you. I did not realize this until just now, that our passage for tonight is the first thing that I ever preached on, the first scripture I ever did a lesson on. I filled in for my dad, who was a preacher, when I was, I think I was 16, and it was on John chapter 10 and verse 10. 
and it's the worst lesson that's ever been preached in the history of the world. My material was horrible, my preparation was horrible, my delivery was horrible, and at the end, you know how if someone does something and they don't do that good a job, you still say, oh, good job, that was a nice try. Everybody's like, well, you did it, you know? <laughs> so uh, that was my first and last sermon ever until someone in college that I respected said, hey, I need you to preach for me on this night. And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. And in my head, I'm panicking. And I said, I'll get out of this at some point for sure. And I just never could come up with a good enough excuse to get out of it. And so I preached, and it, it went better. And uh, I thought, okay, well, maybe I can do this occasionally. And so here we are. But it's like I've come for, full circle on this passage in a way. So John chapter 10 and verse 10. And your theme for the summer series is the idea of abundant life. And you're taking this scripture, really, and you're applying it to all walks of life, how we can have an abundant life in our faith, in our families, in our homes, in our workplace, whatever the case may be. And our idea tonight is how to have an abundant life in sharing Jesus. But if you haven't, if you haven't looked at the background of this idea in John chapter 10 yet, I want us to do that. And I'd, I'd called Jake and said, ask if any of the speakers have dove into the context of it so far, and he said they had not, so we will. So if you look at John chapter 10, we'll get to that in just a minute. We're going to have kind of three phases to the lesson tonight. The first phase, we're going to talk about what abundant life is. The second phase that we're going to look at is the idea of building something. What are you building? And then the last one we'll look at is really the, the crux of our topic, sharing Jesus. So abundant life, building something, and sharing Jesus. The first one is this idea of abundant life. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, this is a discussion of the time when Jesus was a baby. And Herod is in charge, and it's about some of the ideas, the feelings, the thoughts that Herod has when he hears about the birth of Jesus. So I want to read these verses for you. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And here's the key. When Herod heard the king, or when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, this is interesting to me because in Luke chapter 2, in verse 10, when we're reading about Jesus being born, the angels said to them as they were afraid, you're always afraid when you see an angel. Our angels are some sanitized, cute little thing. But the first thing every angel in the Bible says is, don't be afraid. Why? Well, because they were terrifying, I think. And people didn't know what they were seeing. So this, this angel of the Lord, or the, this angel in Luke 2, 10, tells them, don't be afraid. And then he says, because I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So if the birth of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, the chosen one, God in the flesh, this prophecy from Genesis 3:15, this promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12, if that actually happening is good news for all people, why are Herod and the people's first reaction to be terrified? Well, for all his faults, Herod did know one thing, there can only be one king. And so Herod knew that if Jesus is king, who can't be king? Well, well, Herod can't be king. Now, he misunderstood Jesus' kingship in the kingdom, just like his apostles did right up until the last day. But Herod thought that his way of life was being threatened. And the people were afraid, too, because they submitted to the rule of Herod, and they thought their way of life was being threatened. Then think about in Acts chapter 16, Paul is arrested, like he's known to do sometimes. And I want to read verses 16 through 24 for you. And this is all just giving us some background for John 10, 10. But Acts 16, starting in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the ways of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, and this phrase is interesting to me, having become greatly annoyed. So whatever Paul's about to do, it's interesting. He does not do this, it doesn't seem like, out of good intention, out of good motives, out of good heart, out of a commandment from God. But he did it because this lady was getting on his nerves. All right? And so he says to her, uh, he turns and says to the spirit in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Now, eventually he's going to get in trouble for this. And I don't know why he gets in, in, in trouble, why God allows him maybe in this situation to get in trouble. Others he doesn't. Part of me questions if maybe God is punishing his motives. He did a good thing, but he did not do it for the right reasons. And so maybe God allowed him to be punished because of that. I, I don't know. That's speculation. But look at verse 19. And here's the key. When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas 
and drag them into the marketplace before the rulers. You know, you remember the guy in the temple, he's crying out, um, can you feed me? Can you give me money? Can you feed me? Can you give me money? And the apostles say to him, you know, I don't have bread. I don't have water. I don't have money for you. But what I do have, I give you. And they're able to give him something better. He, he was asking for one thing, and he got something better in return. What happens when these men see a miracle performed in front of their very eyes? Now, what should their response have been? To open their hearts, to fall down in front of these men, and to say, tell me how you were able to do this, believing in the God that these men profess. But it's not. They're worried about a little bit of change in their pocket instead of what's more important. So because of that, they seize them, drag them into the marketplace. Verse 20, and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. Now, why did they bring them to court? They brought them to court because Paul cut off the way they were making money and they were upset about that financially. But that's not what they say when they bring them in. They change the reason. These men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. Verse 21, they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And so verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Now if the news of Jesus was intended to bring good news and great joy to the lives of people, why did it not bring great joy to these people? Because their way of life was threatened. And Jesus was asking them to give up something to get something better. All right, now look at our text in John chapter 10. If you have a, a version of the Bible that takes the text and turns it red, then most of John chapter 10 is in red. And even the parts that are in black as commentary, divinely given by God from the writer, we're not sure who Jesus is talking to. And we have to back up to John chapter 9 to see that. So in John chapter 9, at the end of that section, Jesus accuses these people of being blind. Well, actually, let me back up a little bit before that. Let's look at uh, John chapter 9. Look at verses 39 through 41. So Jesus has just healed a blind man. And now the blind man can see. And in verse 39, Jesus is starting by talking to the blind man about what's happened. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see, like you and those who are spiritually blind, may see. And those who see, like the rulers that you have that think they're everything and know everything, may become blind. And look at verse 40. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, basically, Are we also blind? Jesus, are, are you talking about us in this story, are you accusing us, the religious rulers of this area, of being blind? In verse 41, Jesus said to them, if you're blind, you would have no guilt, but now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. And so some of the Pharisees are talking about bl being blind, and they ask him, now Jesus, are you saying that, that we're blind? Now that's a good question, if you come to Jesus with an honest heart, with humility, willing to accept any answer that you hear, and willing to change. But that's not the way in which they were asking this question. It seems like they were asking this question uh, in a tone like, you know, how dare you question us? Don't you know who the religious rulers of this area are? Don't you know how long we've been studying the law, not knowing that they're talking to the law themselves, not knowing that they're talking to the one that created the world that they're standing in and then even created them as people? But they asked Jesus this question. And so that's how we start chapter 10 with Jesus talking to the Pharisees. In the beginning of chapter 10, he accuses them of being blind strangers that sheep will not follow. Jesus says, look, don't you know sheep? If you have a stranger come up to them and try to lead them, they don't know that shepherd. That's a stranger. They're not going to follow the voice of that shepherd. But you have the shepherd come into the picture, and those sheep immediately follow. Why are people not following you? Because you're a stranger who's not reflecting the Lord. These people will follow me because they know their shepherd. And so Jesus then says this to him after he kind of really condemns them and instructs them and tries to correct them. Look at verse 10. That's our verse. That's the verse for your whole summer series. In verse 10, he gives them hope and offers them a way back. Jesus always does. Even if Jesus calls our life into question, even if he corrects us in some matter, Jesus, and that's what makes him so great, always offers us a way home. It's never too late as long as we have breath in our lungs and we'll humble our heart before God. And so Jesus gives, as he always does, a way back in verse 10. He explains to them, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. So I think Jesus is pleading with them. He didn't come to steal their sheep. He did not come to destroy their efforts. 
or destroy their life. But he came to make it better. Jesus came to make their life abundant, the best version of their life. You know, we sometimes see people say, I'm living my best life. And they'll put a picture of them on vacation or at the pool or something like that. And, and really, Jesus tells us what to do to have our best life. It may not be the happiest. It may not, especially, definitely won't be the easiest. But it will always be the best life if we'll follow Jesus. Why didn't, Jesus, uh, why didn't they love and obey Jesus? Well, the same reason Herod didn't. The same reason the people didn't in Acts chapter 16, because their very way of life was being threatened. If you come to Jesus, your way of life will be threatened. But Jesus didn't come to kill, to steal, to destroy, even to condemn the world. But he came to give us the best version of our life. So every discussion of our life and what we do should come from the perspective that Jesus came to give us a better, more abundant life. And so Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Whatever we have that we are holding on to, that we want to keep, Jesus offers us something better if we'll give it up. It would be akin to holding on to a dollar when someone is offering to give us a million dollars in exchange. And again, that doesn't mean it'll be happier or easier. It definitely won't, but it will be better. And so that's what this discussion of abundant life comes out of. People not realizing that they're holding on to something basically worthless in place of everything they could ever hope for and a better life. Now I want to talk about this idea of building something. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now Deuteronomy chapter 6 is uh, Moses. Uh, it's a last sermon, if you will, almost like his last will and testament. Uh, a reminder to the people about where they've been, where they are, and where they can be with God or where they'll be without him. And you'll remember Moses, he was a great leader, really, uh, led the people up to the promised land, but some sin in his life kept him out of it. But God allows him to go up and see it, but not to enter it. And before the people go into the land of Israel, this promised land, the land of Canaan, Moses gives this farewell address, and he reminds them of some things. And so look at chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And remember, again, this is a reference to that promises, promise all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. God promised Abraham, I'll make of you a great nation. Got a great nation, you'll need land. And then Jesus will come through your family tree. And so here Moses reminds them about that. I, I'll give you this land. Here it is. With great and good cities that you did not build. And houses full of all good things that you did not fill. And cisterns that you did not dig. And vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So this is interesting to me. One of Moses' last messages to the people is that they will be enjoying things that they did not build. They will be eating from vineyards that they did not plant, drinking water out of cisterns that they did not dig. They would be enjoying a lot of things that they had absolutely nothing to do with building. Now in John chapter 4, and if you want to turn there, we'll use several ideas from John chapter 4 to finish out the majority of our lesson. But in John chapter 4, Jesus does something similar. And it's, it's interesting to see Moses do something in the Old Testament, and then Jesus goes and does it in the New Testament. We see Moses is kind of a foreshadowing of Jesus. The two great lawgivers, as it were, had so much in common. And in John chapter 4, Jesus is going to do something that, that Moses has just done in Deuteronomy chapter 6. At the beginning of this chapter, he talks with the woman at the well. So look at, uh, starting in verse 27, as he's finished talking with her, this is where we pick up. And just then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So Jesus has this great conversation with her, pricks her heart. She realizes this is that Messiah I've heard about and read about. And she even leaves the water pot, the very thing she came to the well to do, and she goes into the town and she tells people. And as she's telling people, she convicts them. Uh, she convinces them, at least piques their interest, and they are gathering up to come back out to Jesus. And it's in that interim, break as she leaves before she comes back, that this next scene happens. Look at verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. 
Remember, they had gone into town to get food. Jesus, the beginning of John chapter 4, says he was tired. Have you ever thought about that, that human side of Jesus that got tired? You know, the w- woman with the issue of blood, she touches Jesus in the crowd, and Jesus says, who's touched me? And Peter says, who's touched you? We're crowded by people. I, I think he's like, well, who hasn't touched you? And Jesus says, no, this is different. I felt my power come out of me. Have you ever thought about that when you see Jesus do a miracle? That, that took something out of him. He knew that he did that. And in John chapter 4, from all his work, He's tired, and so he stays at the well, and his disciples go to get food. Now they've brought back that food, and they're trying to get him to eat. So he says, I have food that you know nothing about. And so it's silly for us to read this. We almost want to make fun of them, but but we might be the same, and I know we're the same way in some things, whether we see it or not. But they say to him and to each other, has anyone brought him something to eat? They, They think Jesus has literally been given a meal while they were gone, or he had a snack they didn't know about. They don't realize he's talking about something spiritual, and they're focused on the physical. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, here it is, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Uh, There are more important things in life than eating. Uh, You have to do it or you'll die, but you can miss a meal from time to time. There are more more important things than sleeping. You'll have to do that or you'll die, but you can miss some sleep occasionally to get something done and on and on and on. Some of these things we think, well, I would never miss out on that. But we miss out on things that are more important. And so as Jesus always does, he's bringing our attention back to the most important things. It's way more important if you miss a spiritual opportunity than a physical opportunity. And I want to admit verse 35, we'll come back to it. So look at verse 36. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. Verse 38 is our key that ties us back to Deuteronomy 6. He says, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Jesus has sent them to pick from a a vineyard, spiritually speaking, that they did not plant. Let me ask you a question. How many of you were here when this building was built and worshipped in for the first time? Is anybody? All right, so we have about a dozen or so. Uh, How many of you had anything to do with the physical work, like sheetrock, putting in the windows, painting, anything like that? Did anybody do any part of that? All right, so we have maybe three that had done that. Now, what that means for the rest of us that are members here, and those of us that are lucky enough to be visiting today and often as we try to, try to do, is that spiritually speaking, we are living in homes that we did not build. We are eating from spiritual vineyards that we did not plant. We are the recipients of a lot of love and work and sweat and blood and sacrifice from some of the people here but some of the people that have gone on to their reward from the generations that came before us. Anything that we enjoy in this building will largely be due to people that were here before us. And largely, we will be living in spiritual houses that we did not build. God told the people as they entered into the land of Canaan, if you get so comfortable and full from the things that you had nothing to do with starting, that you forget who gave them to you, they will be taken from you. When Jesus is giving his disciples their marching orders, and these are the apostles that are with him, that are going to write books uh, in the Bible, that are going to rule in some way, according to the book of Revelation, at least they're represented, uh, in, in, to, used to represent the New Testament time period, which is an honor in and of itself. And these are men that Jesus is tempering and humbling and saying, anything good you ever do is based on people that have come before you. The same idea is true for us today and gives us an important question. What are we going to build? Will this congregation grow on your watch? Or will it putter along, maintain, or even worse, will it die? Think about what it took to get the church started here in Marietta. Just any, any body of the Lord's church here in this city from nothing. Think about what it took to get the congregation here in this particular spot and in this location. How many people did it take teaching their friends and their neighbors? How many uh, tent meetings did it take? How many door knocking campaigns did it take? How much money did it take? How many people sold land uh, like Barnabas did in the New Testament and gave that money to the the group here so that this building could be built? Uh, How many of us have contributed financially to this building being built? How much did it take to start these classes that, that our kids are enjoying right now, to start the programs that the church does, to go on the trips, to hire the ministers, to have the qualified elders. It took a lot to get to where we are right now. We enjoy a beautiful building with great facilities, great teachers, 
lots of teaching material. We enjoy comfortable air, PowerPoint if we want it, great speakers, great leaders. And it took a lot for us to get to this point. Now let's look back at John chapter 4, verse 35 that we skipped earlier. Because we've had a great head start. And we praise God for all the things that have been done before we got here. But now that we've had such a good head start, what will we build with that? Look at verse 35. Jesus tells them, Do not say there are yet four months, then come the harvest. Because look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see, what the field, see that the fields are white for harvest. Um, we had ministry league here a few weeks ago, which is a great event. Hope some of you got to come to that. And I spoke to some of the teens in the basement, and my topic was seeing a need. And I walked through the beginning of John chapter 4, and the point I ended with was this, is seeing a need. Just like Jesus said, literally open your eyes and look around. There's a need, and there's opportunity based on that need everywhere. The people that need to be taught, the people that need to be ministered to and loved and helped are literally everywhere around us. Wherever we go to work, wherever we go to school, wherever we go to play, are people that need the Lord. And even amongst each other, we need Jesus, and we need to be moved from where we are, as good as it is, to where we need to be, the example of Jesus. Opportunity is literally everywhere. There's no lack of work to be done. And we have a bigger head start with a building like this and leaders like this and a preacher like Jake and some of the others and the technology that we have, the help that we've been given, the budget, the bank account that we have, a head start. Now, here's the question, what will we do with it? So let's end with this third idea, our third phase, if you will, sharing Jesus. And in this, I want to just give you maybe some tips, some pointers, some things that can help. Some of these may not fit well with your personality or schedule. Uh, some of these may be beneath you. Some of them may be above you. But I'm hopeful that everybody can get a few things out of this. Um, we need to all eventually get to the point where we can sit down with someone at a kitchen table and open our Bible, whether we have some material or not, and study with them. That, that's a goal. But for some of us, that might be like saying, hey, on Monday, I've signed you up for a marathon that you have to run. Some of us would be like, sweet, I was going to run one on Monday anyway. I'll just do that one. Some of us would say, well, man, I'm not going to thrive, but I think I will get through it without dying. And some of us would say, just go ahead and shoot me. It's going to kill me. I can't do it. All right? So I'm saying that, that running a marathon might be like asking someone, a member, though it's true and they need to be able to do it, to study with someone. That may be a ways down the road. So what can we do to work up to that? What are some things we can do today, no matter how much time, money, or expertise we have? And that's what I want to do. The first thing I have as a suggestion is to just make spiritual things and conversations normal. Make them normal. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, we could always, around Christmas time, on Christmas Eve, we could open one gift early. And my parents would let me look under the tree and pick any gift that I wanted, and I could open it up the night before. Did anybody else open one gift the night before? All right, cool. So how fun. We were blessed. So some years I would open it up, and it would be an NCAA football game or something. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to sleep tonight. This is... And then some years I would open it up, and it socks. You know, but whatever I opened, that's what I got. All right, so that, that may be weird for, for most of you because only about 10 of us did that. But for my family, it was normal, and I just expected it. Uh, how many of you, when you have a meal, uh, will pray before that meal? Okay, much more of us. Probably the majority of us will do that. All right, do you, how many of us will, when they get in the car with their family to go on a vacation or their buddies to go on a road trip or something like that, will say a prayer at that time of Thanksgiving that you get to go? All right, so several of us do that but not as many. Now, why do we feel like, well, I'm going to say a prayer before a meal, but we might not think to be as thankful in other situations that we should be just as thankful? Well, because by and large, we have collectively made it normal to say a meal before a prayer. And with your friends, if you say, hey, let's just thank God that we have a car and a place to go and money to go with and that we have health and we can go, we haven't made that as normal. And so that's the thing is we get to decide what's normal for our congregation. We get to decide what's normal for our family. One more, and then we'll move on, just because I like this one. Uh, but we have a, a, how many of you have a golf cart? Anybody have a golf cart? So we have, we have some land, uh, and we, we just survey our property with it occasionally. And we really thought it was a good investment. We got it pretty cheap, and if we don't like it, we'll just sell it at some point. But I live on the Alabama Highway in Rome, and if you ever drive through the Coosa part, and you look to the right coming from Alabama, or to the left going to Alabama, you may see me in my yard chasing my kids on the golf cart, looking like I'm going to hit them. And uh, I did this one day, just being silly. I'm going to run you over and chase them. And they love it. And all the time they ask me, hey, will you try to hit us with a golf cart? And 
I'm never going to, but I have to bump them occasionally just to let them know it's, it's real, okay? It's, it's possible. Now, if you drive by in Rome, Georgia on the Alabama highway, and you look to the right coming from Alabama or to the left going to Alabama, and you see somebody driving through their yard chasing their seven, seven, and four-year-olds on a golf cart, that's going to look crazy to you. Admittedly, it is a little crazy, but you know what? For my family, that's normal. Well, because we're weird, and really, ultimately, because we've, we've made it normal. Congregations are exciting that way, thrilling even. You can make it normal to do anything. Families are that way. You can make it normal to do anything. So what I want to encourage you to do is make spiritual things, spiritual conversations, normal. Because whatever you do on a regular basis, that will become normal for this church and for your family. Congregations will grow or just cruise along or just die based on what we make normal. In Joshua chapter 24, In verse 15, Joshua, I think, is doing something kind of like Moses had done in Deuteronomy. And he's giving this address to the people. And here's what he says in verse 15. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Now, what is Joshua saying? He's saying, look, I don't know what you guys are going to do. I don't even really know what all the nations around us are going to do. I don't have control over that, but I can tell you what we're going to do at my house. If you live in my house, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make it normal to worship the God that gave us this land in the first place. So you do, out, do whatever you want out there. But in here, here's what's normal. And that's all that Joshua was basically saying. Here are a few ideas that, that might be able to help you in addition to just making things normal. Maybe some things you can do in your life. First thing is that it's good to remember that sharing the gospel isn't really about us. You know, as Jesus ascended back into heaven and he gave his disciples their mission statement, those marching orders, and he says to, to make disciples. One thing we leave out sometimes, or, or I have in the past, is at the end he says, and lo, I am with you. That's a very comforting thing. Jesus often comforted his disciples before they went into tough situations. John chapter 17 and, and there in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, as you take your marching orders, as you go share the gospel... I'm with you. That's helpful. Whenever we share the gospel of Christ, we're not by ourselves, And that's good because sharing the gospel, it, it's not mainly about us. It feels like it is, but it's not. Our job is not to be the, the wisest or the wittiest. Our job is just to share the gospel without getting in the way as best we can. So just take courage in knowing that even as you share, it's really not about you. It's about what you're sharing. So here are a few ideas. First, be spiritually minded. Um, We drive a Nissan Armada. I'd never heard of it or seen one until we bought one. Now I see them everywhere. Why is that? Did we make it cool? We got an Armada. Now everybody wants one. No. Everybody already had them, and they drive them despite the fact that we do, not because of it. But why do I see it everywhere? Well, because now I notice it. You know the same thing happens with with just about everything. Uh, What you look for is what you see. Some people can come into a place and say, well, beautiful day, isn't it? And somebody else will say, oh, it's hot. I'm about to sweat to death out there. Well, you wait a few months and you say, wow, beautiful day, isn't it? Oh, that breeze is about to blow me over. I hate it. My allergies are acting up. Leaves are everywhere. Beautiful day, isn't it? No, it's freezing. I hate going outside. You know, some people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You say it's a beautiful day and they complain about that. You say, man, the weather's not great and they argue with you about that. Some people are that way because what we look for, typically, by and large, is what we find and what we see. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it's one of my favorite verses. It just says, pray without ceasing, which is a good general rule. But really, the context of it is, look at the verse before it and the verse after it. Uh, verse 16 says, rejoice always. And verse 18 says, give thanks in all circumstances. So Paul's directive from God to pray without ceasing is based on the fact and book, bookend by thanksgiving and joyfulness. We can't really do justice to 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 without understanding why we should pray all the time. It's as if we're so thankful to God that we can't help it. That's our natural reaction. You ever think about just how blessed you are? I mean, even during tough times, how blessed we are. Even if we complain about the prices at the gas pump, I'm glad we can get gas. And I'm glad I have a job that allows me to get it, though I, though I hate paying those fees. And we could go on and on. Everything in life that we have that comes with troubles is also a blessing from God. The only way to get rid of all the, the messy troubles is not to have that thing in the first place. You know, I, I want a clean house. My kids are always messing it up. The only way to get rid of the mess is to get rid of the kids. I don't, I, 
I don't usually want to do that. Uh, I like the kids, and so you know what? I'll take the messes and the problems that come with them. But when I look for blessings, it's amazing. That's what I find. And I see that, and my natural reaction to that, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, is to pray without ceasing. I'm so thankful to God because of what he does, I can't help but say thank you, God, for that. So be spiritually minded, and you'll see spiritual things. Number two, pray for opportunities. Jake, what time do we, does the bell ring or we get out or whatever? Okay, 20 minutes. All right, perfect. All right, Matthew chapter 9, I want to read verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I want to pause there for just a second. Um, Hiram Kemp is a, a preacher, a great preacher. He does a good job. He's just a good person too, but he, ha he shared something one time that really stuck with me, and I thought I would share that with you in this moment. But some people's favorite Jesus is the Jesus that flipped tables in the temple, and they use that to justify, well, see, I can get mad, righteous indignation. I'm going to go flip a table. But what people don't often realize is a couple things. One is that Jesus has just looked over the city and seen it as sheep without a shepherd and has wept over the city. And so the point Hiram made is don't flip tables in a community that you're not willing to cry over. And I thought that was helpful. And it's also helpful to notice that as Jesus goes into the temple and cleanses it, you remember which table he flips? Does anybody remember that? A lot of people do because I heard some whispering, but I couldn't make out any of that. <laughs> Say that again? Okay, money changers, and do you remember what animal what, because, you know, they're selling sheep at an inflated rate. They're selling all these different things at an inflated rate. Which animal was the one that he made a do over and, and flipped that over? Anybody remember? All right, doves or pigeons, some versions would say. When you look back at the Levitical law, Jesus tells them, look, when you go to the temple during this certain time, you're going to bring a, a, a lamb without blemish and you're going to sacrifice it. Now, the only thing, only problem with that is that can be expensive especially for those that are poor. And so he makes an exception to that rule, and he says, but if you, basically, if you can't afford that, you can bring pigeons or you can bring turtle doves because that'll be cheaper on you. And so when Jesus goes into the temple, what group does he address? Well, he addresses those that are selling the pigeons or the turtle doves. Jesus, even in that moment, is protecting those that can't protect themselves. So there's a lot more going on on the surface than just, well, Jesus got mad, I can get mad too. There's much more to that. And here is that same Jesus that we know and love who sees the people and he has compassion because they're harassed and helpless. All right, look at verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Um, I work for House to House, Heart to Heart. Um, a lot of congregations will, will use this. What we do is we produce a magazine and we customize the front and back for the local church of Christ and then we mail it to their neighbors. We do that for Piedmont Road here so some of your neighbors get that every other month. They don't know anything about us or me or how the program works. They just know that Piedmont Road is reaching out to them. And we do that for about 1,000 congregations a month. We mail out about 2 million copies. We, I have been here for almost 17 years. We've been around for about 25 and three years ago, as I was promoting, hey, here are our topics for the upcoming year, I was able to tell people, more people have been converted through our efforts than ever before. The next year, I was able to say the same thing, and it was true. More people had become Christians since the year before. Last year, I was able to say the same thing. Look, more people this year became Christians from our work than have ever become Christians from our work the entire time I've worked here. And this year, we're on pace to surpass that again. At the end of the year, every year, I'll, I'll email. I started this when, when we had such high conversion records being reported back. I thought, is this just us? We're the best thing ever. It's got to be us. Let's tell everybody. Now, but I wondered, does every, what's everybody else seeing? And so I asked GBN, and I asked the Gospel of Christ, and I asked World Bible School and World Video Bible School, and Michael Shank, who wrote, who wrote Muscle and a Shovel. And each of these works has said, each of the last three years, this is the most conversions we've ever had in our entire existence. Yeah, there are more people in the world, but I think a message for us, God's people, is people are looking for the truth. The devil would really love you to believe, oh, nobody wants the truth anymore. Because if that's true, we get a pass. We can come here and we can do these things, and we don't have to do as much outside of the building. We don't have to take the gospel. 
But the fact is, that's a lie. People are looking for the truth. We're averaging more than a baptism a day reported back from our work, which is such a small, small thing in this world. People are looking for the truth. They're hungry for it, if we'll take it to them. Same was true in Jesus' day. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. And here was our, our point for this one. Pray for opportunities. Um, I spoke at something Jake went to last year in Nashville Connect, and they assigned me a topic having to do with evangelism. Since I work from house to house, everybody's like, oh, you'll speak on evangelism. I'm like, well, my day job is evangelism, and I'm, I'm improving on that as a person, but sure, I, I'll be glad to. And so I thought, though, I thought, you know, I haven't had a Bible study with anybody in a couple months, and how can I come say, hey, you guys should have a Bible study with somebody if I haven't done that? That's not, I don't want to hear somebody do that. That's pretty hypocritical. So I just looked in the mirror and started doing some reflection, and we started praying. We have family Bible time every night. Some nights it's like a theological discussion. And I'm so proud of myself. And some nights it's like, shut up so we can pray, you know? <laughs> Most nights it's somewhere in between. Uh, <laughs> we've done both extremes, but what we started doing leading up to me speaking on that was praying for opportunity. God, send us somebody we can study with, send us somebody we can study with. And you know what happened? Uh, a girl that we rented to sent me a message and said, hey, I, you know, I've seen some of the, the books and, and stuff like that and um, the Bible books, and I've, I want to study the Bible. I don't really even know where to start. It's amazing what happens when you just ask God for an opportunity. Um, we have a beautiful picture of, after her baptism, uh, standing in our congregation down in the front, and our three little kids are around her, and she's got her arm, and our lady is looking, just looking up at her. I was able to share that when I spoke and, and just remind people, sometimes the, the problem is us. We don't ask, and we don't look for opportunities. We ask for help, look for opportunities. They show up. There's a guy I play basketball with uh, in the mornings, and we play a couple times a week, and he's a, I don't, hopefully he won't watch this. I doubt he was, will, but he, he's a pretty worldly guy. Uh, he wants to be just rich and successful and just like, he wants to be really worldly, but he doesn't have the success to be worldly yet, but he still really wants to be. But you can just tell he's got a, like a hole in his heart, something missing in his life. And so I started praying for a, an opportunity to reach him and just to, him to open the door. And because I'd mentioned, oh, yeah, when I teach Bible class and just leave that there and nothing's done with it. So I mentioned a, a couple things to him and he said, man, that's really interesting. And he said, how about we get together sometime after after working out and playing ball? He said, he said, I'd love to grab a beer with you. <laughs> so, of course, I went to the bar with him. No, I'm kidding. I didn't. <laughs> Last time speaking at Piedmont Road. No, I'm kidding. That isn't the exact way that I wanted the prayer to be answered, I guess. But the opportunity to hang out and do something. And I said, hey, I don't drink, but I'd love to get together with you. Now, that's a work in progress, and we'll see where it goes. But what happened? What's the only difference that there was? I started praying, prayed for opportunity, and what happened? Opportunity was given. So be spiritually minded. Pray for opportunity. Next, well, let me give you this illustration, then I'll mention the point. If I had a PowerPoint, well, I can do it with my paper. I, I want to just show you a list of everyone in the Bible who did it on their own. And if you want to zoom in on this and take a picture, you can. Or if you want me to email you the notes, I can. But this is a list of everyone in the Bible that did it on their own. You see what that is? That's the blank backside of a sheet of paper. The third point I would say is don't do this on your own. If you want to be evangelistic, you want to bring, bring people to the Lord, don't try to do this on your own. There's a reason that God saw creation and said that it's not good that man should be alone. There's a reason Jesus sent his disciples two by two. Uh, there's a reason Paul took companions on his missionary journey. And we might be tempted to say, well, Jesus did it on his own. But think about that. Jesus, when he first starts his ministry, is baptized by John the Baptist and receives the Holy Spirit. He goes into that great temptation in the wilderness with the, the devil. And then immediately after that, he's ministered to by angels and he picks his disciples. He bookends this, bookends this great temptation with being surrounded by helpers. And I think it's a divine message for us that, okay, you can't do this on your own, but that's good news because you weren't designed to. We need each other. That's why I'm, well, I'll just stay home and watch church online, or I'll, I don't have a group I'm you know, associated with. I just I have my relationship with God. Misses the point entirely. That's not the way God designed it. We actually need each other. Uh, our culture says it's weak to need each other, but God says that's the way we were designed. We need each other. We can do more together than we can do on our own. And I think sometimes we think, man, this Christianity thing is hard, and one reason it is is because we're trying to do it all by ourselves when God never intended it to do that. It won't work that way. And so as you're trying to think about being more evangelistic and looking for opportunities, work with other people. Don't do it alone. We're in this together. You need prayer? Uh, we have a men's group that meets once a week at my congregation. I know Jake does something. You guys do monthly. 
does something monthly. And uh, we have a group text throughout the day. And one of our guys who's really introverted, shy, never mentioned the Lord to anybody, has started working on his coworker, got her a birthday gift. She's got some chores that need done around the house that our men's group is going to go take care of. And he's opening her up to the gospel. He's earning a Bible study. He's cultivating. He's planting. And maybe somebody else will uh, reap the, the crop, but he's at least planting and doing his part. But one of the first things he did is told our group about it. And we all pray about it. I have a note that pops up on my phone every day at 10 a.m., and it says, pray for Laura. Well, he's shared that with the group, and now we can all pray about it. And we can hold him accountable. We can say, hey, how's it going with Laura? And he knows if he's been selfish or if he's been lazy or if he's forgotten or, or if he's been mean or whatever, that he's going to have to answer to the group for that. And now not only that, but we can be over at Laura's home. We can help her. And when she comes to church, it won't be a bunch of strangers, but it'll be a bunch of people that have known her and helped her. Think about this idea, too. Uh, who is where you want to be? You're trying to get, do better financially, and all your friends are broke. It's not good to talk to them about financial matters. They don't know. Find somebody that's not broke. Talk to that person, because they're where you want to be. Same thing spiritually. If you're not a great soul winner, well, that's okay for right now, but do you want to be? And if you want to be, who are you talking to? Who is where you want to be? There are people that are great at personal evangelism that would love to take you on as a student, as a mentor, and to share some of those things. Find somebody that's where you want to be and let them help you get there. Another idea just under the same point of don't do it alone is include your family. Uh, we, I heard of an idea from, from the Collies probably like 10 or 15 years ago, maybe even before we had kids. And, and one thing that they do every service is they have their kids go up and hug a widow or a widow or something like that. And so it's taken me longer than I, I would have liked. I'm ashamed I, I'd forgotten about it or just neglected to do it. But we recently have adopted, each of my kids has been assigned by me in, in a, such a way that they think it was their idea, uh, a set of widows uh, at our congregation. And so what they'll do every service before they are, go sit down and play with their friends or whatever is they'll go up to the widow and they'll hug them and they'll sit with them. And I've asked them to say, hey, if you don't have anything to talk about and it's quiet and awkward, tell them what your Bible class was about. And they'll draw cards for him and things like that. And uh, it's just particularly helpful because the sister of one of our older members is a new convert. And the best friend of one of our older members is a new convert. And so their experience with the Church of Christ is, man, all the little girls at this congregation are, and in the Church of Christ are amazing. They just come up and talk to the old ladies. Uh, and why is that? Well, because we, I don't want to just do things on my own, but I want to as best as I can include my family. Um, that might sound like I'm saying, like, oh, man, I do a good job. I definitely don't. I just wanted to share an example of something that we've done. We could talk about my, my cons much longer than the pros, trust me. Um, we went on vacation uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, probably a year or two ago. We, ha we have some friends that were there, and they were out of town and asked us, well, I think we volunteered to house it because they have a pool and a hot tub. So <laughs> that's just the kind of people we are. <laughs> uh, so we were house sitting for them. We went out to a restaurant, and uh, I carry these cards, my wife does, and I think Jake does too, for the Authentic Christian Podcast. I don't know if you've listened to it, but it's really good, it's really well done. Uh, some of our stuff is really good, but it doesn't look that good. Some of our stuff looks great, and I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'd recommend that to everybody. This is one of the few things that I think is very professional. One of the guys that, that does it went to film school, and it's very sound, and so I feel comfortable um, recommending this to people. So we've gotten in the habit of leaving these uh, every time we check out at a restaurant. And we hit it off really big with the waiter or waitress. We'll tip really big, and then we'll leave one, which I, I hope does a little bit more. Um, but one of the days, uh, Lainey, we were at a restaurant, and, and some older ladies started talking to her and just smiling and laughing with her. And she came back to the table, and she said, hey, I want, I want to give them a, a podcast card. And she, I said, okay, but I'm not going to do it for you. You've got to do it. And so she was nervous about that. Who wouldn't be nervous? That's, <laughs> that's kind of scary, especially for, I think, six-year-old at the time. And so she was like, well, I don't know what to say. And I said, well, she mentioned her grandson. I guarantee her grandson likes dinosaurs. So what you do is you go up and just ask her about her grandson and ask if he likes dinosaurs. And they have done two episodes on dinosaurs and how they're biblical and God created them too. And so she strikes up a conversation with the lady. And it was cool too because she said, does your grandson like dinosaurs? And the older lady said, huh? <laughs> and I'm thinking in my head, she's going to run. I don't know what to do, abort. Uh, but she calmly said, I can't believe this. It's almost like I'm making it up, but this, she did this. Said, uh, does your grandson like dinosaurs? And then the conversation went smooth. Oh, yeah, I love them. Well, I wanted to give you this card. My dad's friends do this Bible podcast, and they talk about dinosaurs, and I thought he might like it. Whew. 
it's a tough thing to talk about because just like with earlier, like how great was that? <laughs> uh, the, the prayer that was, was done was <laughs> like one of the best prayers I've ever heard probably. So uh, I'm also studying for a lesson on Sunday that's about the sacrifice of Jesus. And I've, as I've been reflecting on that today, there's been a couple times I've just had to stop, you know, because I'm, I'm just getting emotional. So this is kind of a build up from that, just thinking about some of the things that, that um, the Lord has done for us. But it's, it's emotional because you think about your, your child doing that or someone you have influence over, and you think about them doing it and how great it is, but then you get scared for a minute and you think, you know, what if we don't make that normal? What, what will happen if that's, that's not the normal thing to do? And it's scary, but it's also a, an exciting thing because we can make it normal. Last thing I'll have on this point, we'll move on quickly, is uh, for leaders, just a message for you is let's include our members in what we do. Uh, there are a lot of members that have never done a Bible study, and they never will unless we show them how. Uh, ask someone to come along and be your silent partner. Uh, emphasis on the <laughs> silent part sometimes, but uh, as they learn how to do that. If you've got to run an errand and visit someone at the hospital, if you've got to take a new mover's basket into the community or um, answer a request for something from house to house, take, some, take someone with you. Uh, earlier today, we have our kids do chores. Maggie's four. She's really too young to do anything and be helpful, but she wants to do something because her sisters do. One of them does dishes, about 75%. We, we help out with the others, and one does laundry, about 75%. But I was putting some clothes, helping the, the one put clothes into the dryer, and Maggie, who's four, came up and wanted to help. Was she any help? I mean, honestly, she really wasn't. She was kind of in my way, and she made it go slower, and she dropped a few things into the floor. But if I ever want her to actually take them from the washer and put them into the dryer, she's going to have to have practice and see how it's done. You and I are the same way. If it's not something we grew up seeing, if it's not something that was normal at our church and our family, we just need somebody to show us how to do it. And so as leaders, one of our jobs is to get the members involved in ministry. And so leaders get people involved. Don't do it alone. Quickly, a few more. Become a better listener. You know, if you listen to people talking, you can actually let them inform you of where the congregation should go or where the conversation should go. Uh, too often we kind of listen with our mouth open, waiting on our turn to talk. And that's not going to help us win anyone to the Lord. Uh, what about come and see? Andrew was really good at that. He told Peter, come and see. He's the one that found the little boy with the loaves and fishes. In the temple, in the last days of Jesus' earthly life, everybody in there that's coming up and talking to him is basically, you know, a heathen. Uh, the Greeks, the Gentiles, are the only ones that had a good heart, and they wanted to talk to Jesus and hear what he had to say. And who took them? Andrew. Andrew was always taking people to Jesus. We can be that way. Uh, if you're not ready to do a Bible study yet, that's all right. Say, come see. Jake's a good preacher. Paul's a good preacher. Chuck is. These are good elders. These are good men. Those are good families here. My kids love playing with your kiddos. People in the community need to see what we've got going on here. It's something special. Just bring them. Just say, come and see. Come with me. Come sit with me. Come to the men's group. Come to Vacation Bible School. There's a lot of opportunities. Tell people to just come and see. Pray for people. Uh, make a list of people who you want to see become Christians. Pray for them. Work to earn a Bible study. If you don't have a list, those people will probably never be converted. Have a list and then think about how you're going to work towards it. Uh, get the materials out of the building. If you've got a lot of tracks in your lobby. Uh, house to house help. Write some of them. A lot of them are good. Some of them are just okay because they're maybe topical or, or dated. But for the most part, they're good materials, but they're not doing any good in here. I mean, sometimes people pick them up, so it's good to have them here. It's good for visitors to know what kind of teaching you have, things like that. But they're not doing any good. What if you made it your goal? Just look, every time I leave, I'm just going to take one, read it, and give it away. Take one, read it, and give it away. Is that a problem if you run out? You okay with that? Take them, get them out of the building. Anything that you've got in here that's of a spiritual nature, take it and give it away to somebody. Last one, and then we'll briefly close. The last thing I think would be good is just start a conversation with people. A few things you can do to start a conversation. Uh, one, live out your faith, and people will, some people will see that, and they'll come to you. I went to uh, see some bands play the other day, and I purposely wore a shirt with a Bible verse on it. I didn't want to be, like, beating people down with it that weren't interested. But a guy asked me, hey, the verse on the back of your shirt, what's that mean? And I explained it, and then my friend Rod, who was with me, had one of these cards in his phone, or pocket, pulled it out, and gave it to the guy, and the guy promised he would listen to it. You know, what will come from that? I have no idea. And that is not as good as sitting down across the table and studying an open Bible. Not at all. But that's the one shot we had with that guy. So be, uh, live out your faith, and people, some people will come and find you. Uh, ask your waiter or waitress what you can pray about for them. Uh, we've done that with a, a couple people. And then leave um, an Authentic Christian podcast card or a copy of House to House or Jake's business card or something like that. 
Um, at Los Portales, it's where we, a Mexican restaurant in Rome, we have a preacher's meeting there the first Thursday of every month. And Jake usually comes, Kevin will come sometimes, Chuck and Paul. And uh, we, ask, we have the same waiter every time, the owner's son, and we ask every week, what can we pray for you about? And the first week he prayed, man, we need more workers. We cannot find workers. The next month we came back, they found workers. And when we asked him, he gave us and our prayers the credit for that. Now, is that true? I have no idea, but he thinks it's true. And that's a good thing for the church. The other day we were with some Christians, uh, did a gospel meeting, and we all went out to eat. And uh, I asked our waitress what we could pray for her about. She really didn't even have anything. She was shocked to hear that, like a lot of people are going to be at first. And so she just said, just pray for me. So, okay. Well, it didn't really have, affect her very much, it didn't seem. But somebody was sitting over here that had just moved to town. And she came up to my mom at the end of the table and said, are y'all a church group? And she said, well, yeah, we just came from a meeting. My son's preaching. And she said, tell me about where you go to church. And my mom talked with her for about five minutes. And I was able to, before we left, introduce her to one of the elders, introduce her to one of the preachers, and give her a copy of House to House. And she said, well, when we finish moving in town, I'm going to come visit with you guys. Why did that happen? Well, we asked somebody, and not even the person we were talking to overheard it. When you do spiritual things, good things happen sometimes. Uh, ask fr people you're friends with about the sermon where they went on Sunday. Ask people what they've been reading or studying from the Bible if they understand it. Ask people what they think about Jesus, which commands are easy to obey, which ones they think are hard. Just start a conversation and see where it goes and see if it can lead to that Bible study. So we'll close with this. In John 10, 10, Jesus is asking the Pharisees something, and he's, he's asking us that same thing now, really. He's asking us to give up something in order to get something better. You know, your way of life, really, if you're not a Christian or if you're a wayward one, is not being threatened, but really Jesus is just promising you something better. And that's why he came, so that you might have life, that we might have life, and we might have it more abundantly. If you'll share Jesus, and that's where John 10.10 10 ties in with this idea of sharing Jesus. If you'll share Jesus, your life will be more abundant, and so will the people that you share Jesus with. You know, church building is a lonely place if you don't know anybody. But it's the best place on earth if you know everyone. But it's even better than that if you help some of the people become Christians and get here. Jesus is not asking you to abandon, give up all your hobbies, give up all your interests, all your travel clubs, all your sports and your extracurriculars because he wants to take those things away from you. But anything that stands between you and him, he's saying, look, if you'll let that go, I'll give you something better. Our conversation should not center around sports and business and the weather and everything except what's most important. When we change the way we think what's most important to us, what we talk about, and we can share Jesus with people. Jesus is asking, look, I'm not here to kill, steal, or destroy, but I'm here to give you a better life, a more abundant life. And if you'll do it right and you'll share Jesus, others can have that abundant life too. Do we have an invitation song? If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, if you can give up what you can never hold on to forever, Jesus will give you something better that you can have for eternity. Now, if you're here and you're not a Christian, or you are a Christian, but you've just been going through the motions and you need some help, everyone that ever did this successfully had help. Ask for the help that you need, and we'll give it. If there's anything the church can do for you, let us know. Come forward as we stand and sing. There's a call come ring over the restless ways and to not be somewhere else speaking. I enjoy going and speaking and seeing places and taking Piedmont Road with me, but it's good to be home and be encouraged, and uh, thank you. I have, I feel good, that feels, and that makes me feel good. Chad's going to have us with a closing prayer, and uh, you will all be dismissed. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the blessings of it. We thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come together and spend time with one another and to hear a portion of your word. Please help us to take what we've heard tonight 
and to apply it to our lives. Please help us to use the different strategies and methods that Mr. Wallen has showed us and help us to implement those in ways that we can. Dear Lord, please help us to be more loving. Please strengthen our faith. Please give us courage. And just help us to do the things that we know we need to do. We love you and we praise you. Holy is your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.